My name is Dylan. I use he, him pronouns, and I'll be your host this evening in the talk Young People and COP26 with the Under 18 Young Greens. And we have three amazing speakers to this evening. We have Josh Dragali from, sorry if I'm mispronouncing anyone's names, by the way. <laughs> we have Josh Dragali from Rockcop and Youth Climate 2021. We have Sarah MacArthur from the UK Youth Climate Coalition. And we have Emma Greenwood from You Strike Climate in Manchester and Friday for Future Digital. Now, I do, met, I do have to mention our safeguarding policy. I have posted it in the chat. And our designated safeguarding lead is Fola, who you may see with the tag safeguarding on his name tag. Please contact him at any point throughout the night if you have any concerns about safeguarding. And if you have any questions, please direct them to Kirsty, who has the questions here in brackets on their name tag. Please put as many questions in as you'd like, we'll, and we'll do our best to get them answered. And so we will go to our, if everyone's all right with that, we will go to our first talk. And that is from Sarah MacArthur. Thanks, Dylan. Hi, everyone. My name's Sarah. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from UKYCC, the UK Youth Climate Coalition. Um, we're a youth-led non-profit group working towards climate justice, um, all volunteers, and we organise almost completely online, um, completely online at the moment. Um, and we look to create a safe, fun space for young people to develop campaign skills. That may be running whole campaigns, joining with partners or supporting work that's already happening. Um, and I'm a part of the COP team, um, Conference of the Parties team. So each year our work revolves around attending the annual COP and also the lesser known intercessionals, which take place each June in Bonn. Um, and they're usually the time when loose ends from previous years are attempted um, to be tied up and plans for the next COP are made. So we have loads planned for every COP and even more so for this year, um, given that it will be in our home country and in my case, it's my home city. Um, so we're very lucky to be an accredited organisation, which means that we get a certain number of passes which will allow some of our members access to the blue zone at COP which is where the main negotiations happen. Um, the green zone is just outside of this and this is where most of the civil society action will take place. Um, we also expect to be engaged here a lot as we won't be limited in the same way that we usually are on who can attend because COP26 will be in the UK um, and that's where all of our members are based. Now this is good for us, um, but this is now the fourth COP in a row that is going to be held in the Global North. Um, and our mission at UQACC is to mobilise and empower young people to take positive action for climate justice. And in the context of COP, you've got procedural climate justice, which is particularly important. Um, this is because who is able to participate in and observe COP decision-making, um, this impacts the shape of the agenda um, and the rules and agreements that emerge from this. And in a, in a year when Black Lives Matter protests have triggered what um, I think we'd all agree is a long overdue reflection on racial violence and injustices, we at UQICC did some reflection of our own and came up with some shared commitments um, and the COP working group our aim from this was to fundraise to ensure that more young people from the most impacted and marginalised communities are able to attend and participate in COP26. We previously have raised funds to support the Brazilian youth group in Gajamundo um, to attend COP25 when the conference was moved um, very last minute from Santiago in Chile to Madrid in Spain. Um, I was also a part of the organising team for the UK's first ever local conference of youth, um, which was for young climate activists to meet and to share knowledge. Um, and these local conferences take place all over the world each year in the month leading up to COP with the, then the global conference of youth, the COI, taking place in the host city to bring young people together from 
all over the world. Um, and UQICC, we're one of the implementing organisations for COI 16, which is happening right before Glasgow, before COP26. Um, and I know that they're really keen to get more young people from the UK um, on board their organising teams. So I definitely recommend checking out the COI 16 website and their social medias for volunteering opportunities there. Um, but anyway, back to our fundraising campaign for this year. Um, we have just this week launched our Mrs. Voice, Missing Voices campaign to support the participation of Global South and Indigenous youth groups at COP26. Um, and we're asking people to join one big, massive sponsor, sponsored exercise challenge, whether that's running, cycling, wheeling. We would love for some of you to join in um, or to donate through our GoFundMe or even just to share the word on social media. Um, we're also looking to lobby the UK and Scottish governments um, as an established organisation, we're very lucky to have some quite good ties that have been built up over the over a decade that UQICC has been running. Um, so we're looking to lobby them to improve, improve access for Global South youth groups travelling to the UK. So that's through things like visa allocations, accommodation and, and now vaccine programmes as well. Um, but our starting point for this campaign was to come up with something something fun, something accessible and that um, everyone was able to get involved in. We're seeing a fantastic rise in young people engaging in the climate movement. Um, I'm just off a call with um, some other UKYCCers. We're in the process of recruiting new volunteers and we've just seen our highest ever number of applications and they were all fantastic, all brimming with enthusiasm and drive to make a difference. and. And this is the case everywhere. Um, everyone wants to get involved um, in the fight against the climate crisis. Um, and it shouldn't just be the big governments who get to dictate how this is addressed. Um, and especially in the context of the pandemic at the moment, um, we're seeing the potential for the UK government um, and governments all over the world to exclude civil society groups from COP. Um, and this potential is, it's bigger than it's ever been because, um, well, we've seen the intercessionals, which I mentioned previously, they are planned for June of this year and they're going to be moved entirely online. And obviously it's completely up in the air. Nobody knows about COP26 in November, whether that will actually go ahead in person. Will it be a hybrid, a hybrid event um, or will it be completely online? But the the intercessionals in June this will be the first public show of leadership from the UK and we think it's it's crucially important that they ensure that civil society participation and inclusion um is is at the forefront of their goals um, and this is one of our nine demands to the UK government ahead of these intercessionals um and yeah you can read more of about them on our website, on our social medias, um, because engaging with the Scottish and UK government um, is a super important part of the work we do leading up to COP26 um, and has been in the past. I think one of the things we have certainly learned the hard way at UKYCC is that you have to weigh up between trying to do everything and be everywhere and, um, and then also actually narrowing down your focus to where you can have the most impact um, and make a change. And a good example of this is at COP24, um, UKYCC turned a lot of our attention to calling out the UK government to include a gender focal point in their negotiations. And this works, it actually happened. Um, the UK government representative that we met with um, agreed to this. Um, and then when we followed up with them after the event, they, they then made the change. And this was able to happen for a few key reasons. Um, first, as I've said, we, we targeted our focus on this specific demand, but also because we knew that as a structural change rather than a policy one, the, the UK government would be in a better position to be able to meet that demand. So that's an opportunity again for campaigning for change and no matter what area you're campaigning for. And 
and it'll certainly be um, a big part of our planning on how exactly we want to target um, to make the most impact um, and lead up to COP26. Um, and yeah, I guess one of the other opportunities that should definitely not be forgotten with COP26, and it's certainly something that we put a big emphasis on at UKYCC, is that at no other time do we have so many other climate activists all in the same space, space together. So regardless of the UN talks that are happening and all of the UNF, triple C jargon, um, that it's a really fantastic opportunity to meet others and build relationships to continue working together. Um, the COP space is, is mad, it's exhausting, um, but it's fun. And I think that's what we have to remember about COP is that we can, it's a fantastic opportunity to meet lots of other people um, whilst being in the same space as these big, um, big governments and, and lobbying them to make to make the changes that we as the youth want to see. Um, um, yeah, that's that's me. Uh, I don't know if we're wanting to do any questions now or I'll just hand over to the next speaker. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Sarah. That was that was amazing. Um, <laughs> You mentioned a lot about the um, Conference of Youth, mm -hmm. which I'd be wondering how would young people be able to get involved more in that? Yeah, uh, well, it's very straightforward. I'm pretty sure that if you go to the website, which will be, if you type in Conference of Youth 16 into Google, um, their website will come up and they've got a tab in there about volunteer opportunities. Um, is probably the best way to do it and I know that they're currently really keen to get people in the UK on board um, particularly because a lot of on the ground work for organising a conference is really helpful to have people in the country that it's going to be held because at the moment they've got this fantastic international team but the practicalities of it is that they need UK volunteers. Yeah thank you so much Sarah. Um, yeah so we'll move on to our, our next speaker now that was incredible. Um, Josh. Thank you. If you, you'd be willing to speak now. Yeah, hope it works. Can you hear me? Yeah, you good. Brilliant. That's, that's, Take it away. that's a bonus. It wasn't working earlier. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, I was going to talk about Mock Cop, firstly, um, which was actually an event that happened at the end of 2020. Um, and it brought together over 330 young people who were representing over 140 different countries to run a sort of youth version of COP26 after it was postponed um, from November. Um, and you probably will notice that the end of 2020 was December and COP normally happens in November. We actually moved the date so that it didn't coincide with Diwali, which was one of the changes that we felt was really important. So I just thought I'd highlight that now in case it caused confusion. Um, but the idea really came from that sense of um, frustration that normally at a COP summit, um, leaders make really, well, somewhat pathetic pledges about what they're going to do in the, in the coming years. But Without COP26, there wouldn't even be the opportunity for leaders to, to make those slightly rubbish promises. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we sort of felt like it was it was a year where it was really important to still take climate action, given that there'll be huge amounts of expenditure over the course of the recovery and supporting businesses over the course of the pandemic. And where that's directed could have a real impact on how, um, how green the transition out of the, the pandemic is. And we felt that that opportunity, that window at the end of 2020 would be really important for sort of highlighting the, the way out and what would be important to, to countries and governments. And there wasn't anything in its place that was going to provide the same level of commitment or the same level of climate action that we'd have hoped that would have come from COP26. So a lot of young people ran their own, basically saying that if we were world leaders, this is what we would do, this is what we would implement. And it sort of came from that place of seeing that in previous climate strikes that have happened across the world, young people have called for more ambitious targets than governments and leaders have been willing to pledge to. So I guess it was saying that you don't often listen to us, so we're going to make our own space and we're going to show you what we want and what we would follow through with to say that actually you need to raise your ambition to match our ambition, because actually we're going to be the leaders in, in the future, we'll be the people that are going to be voting you in or out of power. So you really should be listening to us because this is what young people want across the world. And it was actually really exciting to be a part of, to see the two week conference with the first week being speeches and um, there were some policy experts and some really inspirational people who were talking about their experiences. Lots of young people and people from 
mapper countries in the global south talking about their lived experience of climate change, which I think is again something that's really missed at COP summits. It becomes very abstract and detached and hard to relate to. And in reality, climate change has a devastating impact on people. And that humanitarian side was something that we really wanted to push to leave people understanding why climate change was so important and the devastating impact that that has. And then the second week was when those 330 delegates came together to discuss what they'd learned, what they already knew as climate activists, to come up with a treaty as similar to, I guess, the Paris Climate Agreement and other things that have come from COPs to say this is what we would commit to. It was relatively short. It was 18 policies covering six themes. But I think the content of those six themes is what's really important because it's more wide reaching than a standard COP. We had climate justice, which is something that's very rarely talked about at COP. Um, climate education, which again is, is often sidelined. And we felt that was really important that as young people, we're adequately prepared for what we'll be facing and we can be part of that solution. Uh, we had health and well-being, including mental health um, and healthcare systems. Again, eco-anxiety and the impact on mental health is something that again is, is often neglected by governments, including just mental health services in general. Um, another was climate resilient livelihoods, which included training and reskilling. Um, again, that's quite applicable to young people, but at COPs, they only ever talk about NDCs, which of course was one of the things that we talked about, but is not the only one. And the other one was biodiversity. So I think the fact that it was so wide, um, I think illustrated that COPs are quite narrow focused quite often. And actually, people want to be talking about more than just those themes of NDCs and carbon reduction targets that often feel very detached and just talking about percentages and disagreeing over numbers rather than actually making core pledges. Um, so obviously that was the end of 2020. Um, what are we doing now? Well, there's quite a few months now until COP and we're trying to use that time to talk to governments around the world to say this is the, the um, ambition that young people had at Mock COP26. This is what the delegates asked for. Would you implement these policies ahead of COP26 and will you push for them and that level of ambition at COP26? So there is really to start campaigning with governments and politicians, engaging them on these issues um, and trying to raise that ambition ahead of COP, ideally with at least 30 countries implementing part or all of the treaty, um, which would be a really nice thing to see. Um, we've, we've identified, um, I think, 34 countries that could be high priority countries where we've got active volunteers and delegates and there's countries that are acceptable to these sorts of policies. So that will be the focus for the next few months will be campaigning. Um, England, Scotland and Wales, Northern Ireland, the UK is one of those target countries. So all of the campaigning that everybody does in the UK just feeds into that idea of trying to raise ambition. Um, so it's really great to see all of these groups come together and actually COP is, is sort of a rallying point. Um, all of these actions that everybody individually takes to campaign and to call for more action end up condensing when it comes to COP26, when leaders have to look at everything and they see how much people want this. I think that's something that's really important, especially coming up to COP26. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is to try and ensure youth representation at COP26. So we'd really like to see young people present at COP, able to talk to the negotiators, ideally be on the negotiating team, so to have that youth presence in both the green and the blue zone, to ensure that youth voices are really heard. It's not just a tick box exercise where people have to be on a panel, they have to have like a certain number of young people on every advisory group to say that actually we're going to be listening to young people and they can be part of that process. It won't be hidden away behind closed doors. I think that's probably all I'll say about Mock COP other than one of the projects we're working towards at COP is to do a VR exhibition, um, sort of highlighting some of the climate solutions from the eyes of young people on the front line of climate change. So they'll be talking through some of the solutions to climate change, linking it to some of the climate policies. So the idea would be that you get sort of transported to a drought or a natural disaster that's caused by climate change, but they'll be talking you through policy solutions. The idea would be that it really uplifts people. Um, and at the moment we're doing a crowdfunder for that. Um, but it's part of the big give, um, I can't remember what it's called, like match funding thing. So for every donation that we get, it actually gets doubled. So that's quite exciting. Um, so hopefully that will be at COP. Um, but if not, it will be video clips on YouTube to just illustrate some of the impact that climate change has to try and shift that focus away from numbers towards the humanitarian side. I guess that will be me finished then.
thank you so much, Josh. That was that was great. Um, you mentioned about the wide-reaching kind of like pledges and the treaty that Mockcock made up. Um, what kind of you mentioned the themes, but what kind of more specific policies, just some examples? Okay, so um, there were eighteen. I can't remember them all. I know that one of them was mandatory climate education. So governments would ensure that young people um, who were at school, at university, at primary school, would be taught about climate change in lessons. So it would be a core component of education across all subjects. It wouldn't be sidelined to environmental studies. It would be something that you learn about as a core aspect in the same way that we'd learn about um, human rights and we learn about, um, well, in the UK, we learn about politics and how to vote. Well, they don't tell us how to vote. They tell us that we can vote. Um, so that was one of the policies was that we'd have climate education. Um, there were quite a few others. I think one of them was about ensuring that NDCs were fully in line with the Paris 1.5 and that that would be independently sort of verified that that was the case, that there'd be a system to ensure that people were in line. Um, sometimes it's hard to know with all of these targets that are banded around. And um, if you wanted to read the whole treaty, it's mockcop.org forward slash treaty and there's all 18 policies there. Uh, thank you, Josh. Um, well, would you be able to clarify what NDCs are for people who might not know? Yeah, sure. They're the nationally determined contributions that um, countries pledge to like, reduce their carbon emissions by. So we, um, we saw today Joe Biden pledge the US would decrease by 50% by 2030. So that would be an example. Thanks so much. Yeah, that, so that's Josh done. Thank you so much for that. And we now go on to our final speaker, Emma Greenwood, who is from You Strike the Planet Manchester and Fridays with Future Digital. Emma? Um, amazing, thank you. You, you two are made, uh, before who spoke are absolutely amazing. And Mock Cop, I look up to him. I uh, was at Fridays for Future Digital, have as well. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm Emma. I'm a 17 year old climate activist. Um, I'm involved in Youth Strike for Climate Manchester. I helped to found it back in February 2019, which feels like a world away from where we are now. Um, and in February of 2020, I joined the Fridays for Future Digital team. Um, so I'll kind of focus more on Fridays Future Digital because that's what's doing the biggest work around COP. Um, so FF Digital is an international organisation that basically centres around empowering and enabling young people to take climate action. So as we all know, there's a lot of privilege involved with climate activism. And for a lot of people in MAPA countries in the global south, activism isn't a safe or accessible mechanism to fight for climate justice. So for example, we've got activists in the Philippines where they could get arrested and even sentenced to death simply for going on a protest. And it shouldn't be fair to them that they can't um, voice their fears though. So basically the aim of FF Digital was to create an accessible platform for young people to take action on the fears and to be able to raise the voice. And for people in Global North who have an immense amount of privilege, like many of us here do, to help give them a platform and to help amplify their voices and lift them up. Um, so we tend to do this through something called digital striking, which is obviously since the start of COVID has massively increased. Um, and I think it's quite fortunate that the two things sort of seem to coincide. Um, and digital striking has kind of been the main mechanism that young people around the world have used. And I think it's played a huge part in connecting young people from many kind of the global north countries to people in the global south and seeing the first hand effects of the climate crisis because it just it isn't something that's covered in the mainstream media and I certainly didn't know the, um, the extent of kind of the effect on countries like Tuvalu and things who kind of communities are just completely disappearing and we shouldn't be reliant on the media to cover these things because these voices are just completely forgotten and kind of as we said before they're just turned into numbers and are com uh, completely dehumanized. Um, and so the aim kind of that FF Digital's got around COP26 is to educate, inform, empower and enable. So as we've seen, that there's just so many acronyms with COP26 and I've kind of never been to a COP and the blue zone and the green zone took me far too long to get my head around. And kind of if I'm struggling with that and I'm a climate activist who's got a good education and has got time to look into these things, people in global, global South who don't have access to these, the networks that I do or the information, they're going to struggle even more. And so we hope to educate people in an accessible way to help engage with COP because if you don't know what COP is and how the process works and how you can get involved then you've got no chance of having your voice there. 
Um, so from around June until hopefully COP takes place in November, we're going to be running educational sessions, educational posts and ways that people can get involved and mainly focusing on not how pe people can physically get to COP26, but how we can utilise the voice of young people across the world to help bring them together in a really powerful way. Um, this is obviously changing as kind of COVID changes because the accessibility of things is constantly kind of um, changing. But um, yeah, that's what we're hoping to do. Um, there's an amazing team of people in FF Digital that work on a multitude of things. We're currently working with some climate scientists because a big problem and disconnect is generational. So there's lots of young people who want to take climate action and there's lots of adults, but it seems to be this really big gap in the middle where there's just no crossover. And um, when realistically, I think there's so much we can learn from each other, um, whether that's kind of campaigning that people have done since kind of the 1970s that we could learn from but also things that adult can learn from us about the power of social media and the power of acceptance and action in an inclusive way um, and so we really hope that we can help bring people together like that and yeah just create this massive force that can campaign around COP26 and that when it is taking place that social media is awash with messages of what people can do and that it isn't just something that is exclusively for people who are physically at the event um, it's a big challenge, we know it is, um, but we're working with some incredible people to try and change that. So hopefully um, we can do it. And there's also some people obviously physically working to get a map of people to COP26, which is the main aim of like the Central Prize Future group that we've got going. Um, and so, yeah, that that's me. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, yeah, you brought in like a really interesting point that I personally hadn't thought about, about activism being dangerous in places in the world itself. I don't really think of it that way, but it's, uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned that you were mainly going to speak about your Friday future thing. Um, I'd like to just dodge you a bit on the <laughs> you strike for climate Manchester. How, how was it to be involved in a city the size of Manchester with so many young people so passionate? And what do you think we can, how, how do you think we can harness that? Yeah, so I get really emotional when I speak about the strikes because we did one in September um, 2019, which was the general strike for climate, where there was huge ones across the world at kind of a level we've never seen before. And I think there was around 10,000 young people in Manchester, which is like, it, it was just incredible. And I think as a young person, it can be so hard to find that group where you feel you fit in or where you feel people have the same fears as you in that sense. Um, but when you're at that strike, I think there's this atmosphere of acceptance and joint unity and joint anger. And you just, you're sort of in this big bubble where you all feel like the entire world is fighting for the same thing. And I think the power that was felt on that day and the empowerment that I got from it kept me going throughout the pandemic when activism got a lot hard when we couldn't physically strike. Um, and I just think, especially on a local level, um, there's empowerment in young people coming together because there's a lot of regional issues that just aren't relevant to other places like Manchester's public transport network is like it's terrible it's such a bad public transport network it isn't accessible and it's very expensive whereas that isn't necessarily something that a city like London struggles with so I do think there's power in bringing young people together to fight for issues that are relevant to them because it's just human nature that we tend to focus on things that affect us personally and affect us firsthand um, and the kind of, I think, utilising that first-hand effect that it has to use it as a mechanism to educate people on things affecting other people around the world is sort of a good gap in the door to go in through, if that makes sense. Because um, I think sometimes if you just come at people who aren't actively engaged in the environment network with like mapper countries, people in the global south, they just instantly turn off because they just don't think it's a problem that they have to deal with. But making it relatable to them and then opening up those issues, I think, is possibly a more accessible and engaging format to do it. Um, so that's something we try to do at Ustrike Manchester. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you so much. Well, that, that's our three speakers. Um, if you remember, if you have any questions, send them to Kirsty. But we do have a few in. And as Kirsty is our quiz, is our question master, not quiz master, <laughs> our question marker, they will hand off and... Firstly, go and ask some questions if you can see. Thanks. So we've had a few in from the sign up form. So I'll just start with that. And I suppose this links quite well on from um, what Emma, you were just talking about. But if any of the other speakers want to um, add in about this, but um, how are you taking an intersectional approach to climate activism? Uh, should we maybe start with uh, Sarah? Do, is there anything that the um, climate coalition is 
working on in terms of intersectional activism? Yeah, I think that was a big part of our reflections, like I was talking about this year, um, that we've been doing and really reflecting on our privilege as activists in the UK. And we don't have that same pressure on us if we're striking that we're going to potentially be put in harm's way. Um, like like Emma, you were saying that example is that's absolutely terrifying. And that's just not something you ever have to consider if you're striking in the UK or a lot of other global North countries. Um, so yeah, it was about, we've been partnering up with um, a couple of um, organizations that we have links with in the Global South. I mentioned Engajamundo and the Brazilian Youth Climate Group. Um, so we've been doing some work with them and we're hoping to, hoping to get some stuff um, out in the public domain soon with some events that we're planning with them. And, and it's, it's about sort of handing the mic, I think that was also said today, is that it's about getting lived experiences from people in the global south who who don't get that platform and who can't physically access the cop space or even if they can physically access the cop space don't necessarily get through the barriers that are put up in all of the acronyms and the jargon that goes around the NDCs and greenhouse gas emissions and all of that and and it's just not an accessible space um if you haven't been upskilled enough to learn about it um so yeah that's <laughs> my roundabout answer to that Great, thank you. Um, I suppose we could, do, do either of the other speakers have any other additions to that or? We'll go on to another question. Um, so uh, I suppose uh, one question I have is, um, uh, maybe Josh, you could start this off, is kind of which countries have like the most active like youth activism kind of scenes and, um, yeah, I think that's quite interesting to see, you know, which countries kind of are quite willing to to meet um, quite progressive targets at COP26 and which countries are going to prove more of a problem, do you think? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think it's really important as well to work out an answer to because it, it helps to sort of focus where campaigning happens. And I think there's actually a difference between where the like active people are and which countries have the progressive, like the progressive governments. Um, I think something that we found with Mark Cop was that most of our, like the, the countries with the largest number of applications were the UK, which we sort of expected, but then it was Nigeria, Kenya and India. And lots of the other European countries had fairly few applications. And actually there seems to be a difference because on, on like the, the leaderboards of which countries are progressive, it's always Europe, it's always global north countries that end up on that list and it misses off most of the other countries. Um, but where the like the biggest groups of active people are, we found that they were in Africa and they were in Asia and they were in South America and Latin America and the Caribbean. So there seems to be a difference between where people categorize progressive countries and where there's like a real group of people that want to be making change. Um, but yeah, I think some of the ones that we found that, that seem to be quite progressive, um, some of the Scandinavian and Nordic countries seem to be quite progressive, but then Lots of that might just be governments making statements and they're not backing it up with action, which is something that we see quite a lot. Um, countries seem to quite like throwing around targets and talking about how great they are and sort of outbidding each other and competing when it comes to these targets, but then they rarely back it up with evidence of how they're going to be doing that. So it's, it's a difficult one, really. Um, I think the answer is campaign where there's people and campaign where you feel like you've got a, a large chance of success. Um, and, and then you can sort of say like this country's done this and they've actually backed it up so you should do better i think that that sort of idea is quite good especially when countries seem to be wanting to be like world beating or the best in the world um i think i think that's probably a good way of doing it um but there just does seem to be a discrepancy between the two yeah thank you that's actually that's actually a really good point that we kind of view the countries in the global north as being very progressive and don't actually really consider a lot of other countries that are you know acting on their climate targets um uh i suppose a kind of related question is um are you optimistic for success in striking a good deal maybe we could uh start with emma on this one i'll touch on the one before as well um yeah yeah, yeah. 
because I was just going to add, I think we have this view of activists and people actively doing things as a very much like a, a publicised um, media profile sort of aspect to it. When in reality, the amount of Indigenous groups there are that are just inherently environmental activists because they just they live off the land. They, they've kind of their, the observations that they've made of climate change. They haven't got any climate science as we view it, but they've fully acknowledged the fact that climate change is happening and they have data that is sort of more accurate than any science we've got. And I think it's important that we recognise that climate activism isn't just the kind of vocal one, the media profile that I think we see now, that actually Indigenous groups who've lived off the land and who actually kind of care for 80% of the land, but only make up 8% of the population. These people are probably the biggest assets to the planet. Um, and it's just impossible, it, important that we recognise them because a lot of the time I do think they're, they're forgotten by the media and they're not given the platform they deserve for the incredible work that they do to kind of protect and understand the biodiversity that our planet has. Um, but in terms of the question you asked on policy, um, I, can you repeat the question? I think I've forgotten it on my waffling for the one before. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I was just asking um are you optimistic for success in striking a good deal at cop26 um i think there's a place for optimism because it is there's a certain momentum i think that we've not had before um it kind of the youth strike movement and striking across the world and environmental awareness has just increased um since like the youth strike started and Greta started striking in sweden um but i do think there's a certain hesitation there has to be because there is this increase in presence of targets that like, seems to be becoming more and more ambitious, like Boris Johnson has um, brought our carbon neutral targets forward, but we weren't meeting the original targets that were there in the first place. So him bringing them forward with no extra evidence of how he's going to meet these increased targets when he wasn't going to meet them in the first place, it's this sort of thing where I think we have to be aware that there's a difference between policy and promises and the Paris Agreement and what countries begin to take action on and how much they're willing to sacrifice because at the moment I think we're still trying to stay in this very comfortable um, politically safe spectrum where parties don't want to push the country too much and lose support but I think there's only so much that can be done in that sphere and I do think it's going to have to get to a point where we become uncomfortable and we have to sacrifice things because the fact is we've only gotten to this comfortable place where we are now from exploiting the planet um, and I do think at the moment there's there's a place for optimism, but there's also a place for caution and scrutiny and pessimism in a stance. Because if we don't question what leaders are doing, um, we'll never they'll never have enough pressure on them to take the true action that's needed. Yeah, that that's definitely yeah optimism and but keep you know holding your guard up. If that that's not the right wording. Okay, <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, I suppose one question that I'd probably like to ask all of you is, um, so recently Greta Thunberg expressed her view that uh, COP26 should be delayed for another year so that it can be in person um, uh, and so that everyone can be safe. And I suppose, um, what, do you, what do you all think about this? Do you agree or do you think like an online or a hybrid event would work? Uh, should we start with Sarah? Um, I personally would be really, really cautious about if it goes entirely online or if it even a hybrid model of COP, because like I think I touched on earlier, that that provides an opportunity to exclude the most affected groups of climate change from the negotiations. It allows vested interests, so the big polluters, the big corporate polluters to be able to get into the negotiations, get in the back door. Um, there's so much more opportunity for stuff to go on behind the scenes that, that the rest of the world doesn't know about. So that's why I'm cautious to say I want it to be online, but obviously we want it to be safe. So I, I would probably echo Greta's thoughts about pushing it to make it as in-person as possible. Um, so pushing it, be that another six months, a year, um, I, I, some of, I know the UK government is wanting it to be in person and I think they would support um, a push to make it be delayed again, um, whereas, and I think that would be supported by a lot of Global South countries, whereas other big Global North countries like the US and countries in Europe um, would be more keen to see a hybrid online model. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I think it's hard to um, speculate on what it'll be right now. Obviously, we've got intersessionals online, but who knows what it'll be like in November. <laughs> Sorry. 
still muted. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, Josh, I suppose what what do you think about the um potential of COP being delayed again? Um, I I don't think I've made my mind up about it. Um, is it's such a difficult thing to try and work out what would be best. But I, I think if it was postponed, I would be concerned that if there wouldn't be anything in its place that they wouldn't that they would decide to wait a year to enact climate policy or to come up with ideas or to even put um, things in place to meet the existing targets that, like Emma said, they're not even meeting. So I'd be concerned that that would just push climate action back by a year. And I think if it was to be pushed back six months a year, it's really important that they do stuff without COP as the sort of launch stage or the big publicity stunt they should just get on with climate action they don't need to wait for cop to do that and i think that would be really important i think one of my concerns if it was to be online is that how would that look for civil society to engage that would be potentially very difficult um it would be harder for for those groups to to back up and reinforce some of the underrepresented views um some of the voices that are often neglected they, ne they won't necessarily be civil society as strong to be able to try and lift those voices and sort of amplify them when they're potentially ignored by some of the big players. Um, so I think there's like pros and cons to both. It's really difficult. I guess ideally, I'd love it if coronavirus had all been like, I don't know, fixed probably isn't the right word, but if everything was properly back to normal and it was all safe and then it could all happen in person, that would be ideal. I think that's what I'd like. I don't know if that's realistic at all. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we're hoping will be done with soon <laughs> um yeah and emma what are your thoughts on the potential of it being postponed um so i personally agree with greta that it should really be postponed i just think um outside of the context of cop 26 the global north countries have quite good open dialogues around climate policy um and i think actually the biggest countries that need to participate is connecting the global north and global south who are very often just separated and not seen as uh, have more of a problem and more barriers to working together um and so a cop that isn't accessible to many people from the global south i don't think is really a cop in itself so it sort of lose its true purpose and its true effectiveness um, and so i'd question whether a cop held online would be any better than a cop not held um, but I do agree with Josh that if there isn't a COP, that isn't an excuse for countries to then go, oh, let's wait another year to take climate action, because they could say that for eternity, and I think many countries would. Um, the fact is that many countries have ambitious climate targets to be working on, and they don't need COP to start doing that um, and delaying it. And COP26 in, in the first place shouldn't have been the main mechanism to kind of launch countries' environmental action. They should have been doing it back at COP25, and I think this expectation that COP, the COPs are like this, this launch pad for environmental efforts is just really unhealthy, because it isn't something that we can keep waiting to events for and waiting until Earth Day and things like this to do actions. I think we try and pin it too much on events when in reality I think it should be something that's ongoing and these events should just be more hubs to come together and reflect on what we've done instead of being a launch pad to start something new. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah definitely I think it's a very um, a very difficult issue to to try and decide about because it's obviously already been postponed for one year um, and then I suppose kind of um, as one final question, I suppose we would say, what if you could give you know one piece of advice to green councillors or to you know green uh, you know environmentally minded youth strikers, um, trying to you know push for their demands to be met at COP twenty six, um, how you know how would you advise that they do that or they support um, you know uh, proper action and good policies uh should we start with josh it probably sounds really boring but um the number of times mps have said that they don't get letters about climate change so they don't think people care and therefore don't vote about it don't talk about it in parliament i think letting representatives know that actually you care about this and this is something that's really important is a really good mechanism and i think the same applies to the negotiating team for cop 26 uh, the same applies to government ministers um, and it's like the most boring form of activism I think you can do writing letters I always find it the heart like the least interesting I feel like you get the least back from it but I feel like it, it does probably have an impact it if people have to keep reading letters and giving the same response of like oh we're already ambitious or whatever it is that they've pre-scripted 
they might start to think like what why do people keep thinking we're not doing good enough maybe we aren't um but then obviously there's the other stuff as well um i think those i think the strikes when they were safe to do them before coronavirus i think they had an impact because you could just see the sheer number in one place you could take a photo and people could look in the newspaper and see how many people thought that this was a huge issue i think i didn't really answer the question because it was about councillors um i don't really know sorry <laughs> i didn't really I mean, answer that very well. i think that was a good response that really interested me that people that mps think people don't send letters about climate change because i was just thinking i've probably sent more letters and emails about other things even though climate change is probably one of my top priorities so actually that's very interesting um emma i suppose advice for young people advice for counselors just you know yeah i think the big thing that i've learned over covid is the power of movements there's this real big individualistic push within many kind of environment networks and from companies as well this belief that it's sort of individual action that's responsible for solving the climate crisis because if you put the burden on the individual stop looking at the big people and holding them responsible um but i think there's so much power in coming together as a collective and fighting for one thing i think your voice holds power as an individual but when you multiply that with many others i think you can achieve more when it's concentrated and so finding a local movement finding a nationwide or worldwide movement setting one up um there's climate action groups get your councils called climate emergency there's so many actions that can be taken and just put a message out on kind of social media see if anybody in your community is like-minded you might not meet in someone new and pushing for change and i think it's just important to realize the networks that we have in our communities and the kind of the power that empowerment holds whether that's kind of empowering people on a local level or an international level, it all makes a huge difference. And just helping to find those people and helping to bring people together is, I think, more powerful than we can ever imagine. Yeah, thank you for that. There were lots of really good ideas there and strengthening community is definitely a kind of green value. Um, and finally, Sarah. Um, I think I really a, a bit a echoing, I guess, on the letter writing to your to your local MP or your councillor or your MSP in Scotland um, is keeping climate the climate crisis on their radar and bugging them to um, declare climate emergencies, like we were saying, and incorporate climate justice into every policy and every part of legislation that's being passed. I think that's a really big issue we've seen with climate change is it sort of getting siloed um, into the corner and not be abedding it across the whole of policy making when climate change is it will affect everything and everything that we change in terms of legislation will have an impact on that um, in Scotland we saw the there was a youth climate hustings um, a few weeks ago um, where we got all of the five party leaders together on zoom um, to answer questions from young people on climate change and I was amazed watching it at how uncomfortable some of the questions made certain politicians um, and it was really really fantastic and a lot of the stuff they said was maybe quite greenwashy but I think one thing they all took away from it was that young people care and young people are angry and young people want to see action from their politicians um, and yeah it's it's about keeping it on the on the radar of everyone and, and writing letters and um, engaging in events like these, engaging your MP, tweeting them, whatever, um, make them know that you care. Yeah, thank you. Some great ideas there and I'll definitely be watching that climate hustings after this. Um, I think Josh has some links and um, like actions to attach, so. Yeah, so I did make a short PowerPoint, but it's really boring and the font is really, so I'll just put the links into the chat instead. Um, so the global young greens, a bit more extreme than us, are also forming a COP working group and they're looking for applicants. I don't think you need to be a member, you just need to be somewhat green. So that's there. Then there are a number of click to tweet things. So basically you press it and then if you have Twitter, it will automate a tweet for you. One of them is for UK Climate Coalition, and that is about the Missing Voices Challenge. I don't know what order these are going into the chat, so you might press the wrong one, but it's probably worth doing all of them. Uh, one of them is for Mock Cop and 
their green match fund. So as Josh said, if you donate at the moment, then it will be doubled, which is quite useful for them. And that's all I've got to say really, but watch out for the links. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I suppose all that's left to say is thank you so much to all of our speakers, Emma Greenwood, Josh Tregale and Sarah MacArthur. Thank you so much for giving up your time for free and coming to speak to us. Um, it's been really amazing and I've definitely learned a lot um, myself from, from hearing you all. Um, so if you're a member of the Green Party and you want to get involved in work surrounding COP26, uh, you can join the Green Spaces page called COP26 Glasgow and you can become a COP champion as in, like, in the COP group um, by emailing the leader of that group, uh, Julian Dean. I'll, would someone be able to put his email in the, in the chat? Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, if anyone here isn't a member of the Green Party, I mean, why not? Why aren't you? Just putting it out there. But, you know, um, we're, you know, we're the party with the best policies. We always stick to our values and hate to, hate to brag, but I think we also probably have one of the best under 18 networks of any UK political party. Just saying, you know. Um, and if you want to follow what the under 18 Greens are doing, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And if you are a member, you can join our Facebook group. Exciting times. Um, so we hope you enjoyed this event and learned something from it and will be involved in climate activism and um, COP26 for, well, not for years to come, but you know, in, in the coming months. Yeah. So um, we hope you enjoyed it. Yay. Thank you so much, everyone.